Hello and welcome to Getting Started with Music Appreciation. I am Paul Bass and I am here. I'm helping producing this with our very special teacher today, Professor Carol. Today we're talking about getting started with music appreciation and we're speaking about understanding form. I'd like to introduce you to Professor Carol. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for joining for this. I know you have a house full of children and I know you're a great music lover and spend a lot of time working with them with music. So I hope you'll find this to be fun too. Um, appreciate all of your help over the many years. Um, welcome to everybody. We are doing the series of podcasts that are cultivating, um, a, we hope, uh, some hooks for you to work with your younger children in that thing we call music appreciation. I don't really like that term. Music history is a little bit too off-putting, especially with little ones. Let's just say music, the loving of music, which of course is part of what uh, comes under that rubric, music appreciation. But the thing is we need, um, you know, we instinctively appreciate things like beautiful nature and food and wonderful smells because we sort of have the understanding of these things and an immediate attraction. But when we take on the arts, sometimes we immediately are attracted and dive right in. But sometimes we feel, well, I don't know all this or I don't didn't get a background and I never learned this and I didn't play an instrument. And then we don't think we have the hooks or the tools that we need, even though we love what we hear or view in the arts. So part of what I want to do is help you with some of those hooks or resources or tools or approaches, roads, doors, openings, whatever you want to call it. And we have had already two in this series and we've spoken about the five elements of music, um, which I'll continue to refer to. And just to reiterate that, um, I should ask you, Paul, but that's not fair because you didn't plan on coming back with it. But first melody, right? The one that most people think about. And I know if I turned to you, you'd come up with a beautiful melody that you'd sing. Um, and we talk, that's sort of an instinctive thing too, although there are many kinds of melodies across Western cultural uh, history. And the sense of melody around other parts of the world is different than we have within Western culture. So, but melody people understand uh, generally is a set of pitches that make a coherent emotional statement that we can remember in our ears and that composers use to work with to create compositions. Harmony, the chords or the, the, the stacking of notes underneath those melodies, you think of a guitar or an auto harp or a banjo or a piano doing chords. Yeah. That kind of idea that accompanies melody usually sometimes just stands on its own. Uh, rhythm, the pulse, the beat, the meter with which we could play forever. You could do so many fantastic things uh, with little ones with rhythm. They're so attracted to, let's face it, banging on things, right? Uh, and they're not just doing that to be annoying. That's a different talk. They're not doing it to be annoying, maybe sometimes, but mostly they're exploring the sound of the pulse and the feeling of the pulse and the it's math. It's math in action is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then two terms that we don't think of as often uh, instinctively. One is texture that I mentioned before, and we'll get to that as a, as a focus one day in these podcasts. Texture is this piling up of musical voices. I made the statement about when we sing rounds like Frere Jaca or Row, Row, Row Your Boat, and we bring in one voice line, and then someone comes in with the second voice line, staggered, and then the third voice line. And before it's over, if you have enough groups, you have this marvelous wash of musical lines all coordinated. And that's basically what texture is. When you hear a band or an orchestra or a choir, you're hearing not just a single melody line, but a stack of melody lines that fit together. And that's texture. And it's even more pronounced within orchestras or bands or ensembles with different instrumental sounds, which brings us to the fifth element, timbre. And I'm going to review these a lot in this series. Timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E, doesn't look like timbre, does it? But what can you do about French? Timbre, which is the orchestral color. The reason my voice sounds different from yours, Paul, and, you know, there's all kinds of physiological explanations of why our voices, even though they operate the same, are different. Or, Paul, what's your favorite instrument, by the way? I that's a terrible question. What instrument, when you think instrument, what's your favorite sound or one of them? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to have to say at this moment, ukulele. Ukulele. Now, who expected that? You see, I'm thinking he's saying trombone, trumpet. I don't know what he's saying. <clears throat> ukulele, of course, ukulele. Well, why does a ukulele sound different from a mandolin or a banjo? I mean, I'm not asking you the answer, but what explains it is acoustical sci science, yeah. the, the form, the wood, the shape, the tuning, the strings, 
right. the, everything. But timbre is that wonderful world of musical sound where we explore the difference between a ukulele and a banjo and a mandolin and a guitar and a harpsichord and, and, the, and an auto harp and whatever else we can think of. Um, so timbre is a big quality in music and composers are always working with those, those five, melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, and timbre. Outside of those five, it's what we do with it. And that's our topic today, form, musical form. And that can be something that sounds very hard if you talk about a, a sophomore, junior level college music theory class where we're analyzing a Brahms symphony. You know, that's pretty challenging. You don't get there overnight, by the way, and your three-year-old is not going there, although your three-year-old will respond to sophisticated manifestations of musical form. That is a fact mm -hmm. without knowing, and we do. Paul, you've been spending your whole life responding to musical form. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I, I never knew that. You, well, you the one that revealed it to me. Well, now we know. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, one of the simplest ways to look at form, I'm going to just give you an example musically, and then I'm going to back off musical uh, examples and then come back to them. One of the simplest ways is to think of the hymns that we sing. Mm. Um, there's verse hymns where you have one melody and you keep changing the words. Uh, and we could think about many, many of those. And we also have something that's very familiar to people, which is verse refrain, which is where you have something like blessed assurance, where you have a set of the, the poetry, and then you come back each time after the first of the verse part, and you sing, this is my story, this is my, and that's always the same, right? And then you go back to the da-da-da-da-da with the, whatever words are in that verse, and then you come back to this is my story. And really, you might argue that that's the most natural. And, and I just think my mic again fell. We've had trouble with no. this mic falling. Let's see. I, I see something there. Oh, it, it's going to come. And oh, that there it is. that happens, I'm going to readjust okay. this. We obviously need some, this, I don't know what this will sound like. We'll get to watch Professor Carol adjust her mic now. Let's see. I Would you like some duct tape? I was going to say super glue is what we probably need. <laughs> well, it's going to be on the outside now, yeah. not as fashionably placed everyone okay but maybe it'll stay yeah and we'll work on that oh, that looks good doesn't it really yeah. matches the colors fine okay so i was back to verse and refrain if you think about that that is maybe the one of the most satisfying types of hymns to sing because you have the section where not everybody knows the words always right we're kind of stumbled but then we get mm. this is my story and we're happy right because oh we know that section the refrain so you right. see, whether you've thought about musical form or not, if you've sung hymns like that, you've either been singing the verse ones where each melody, each time you come back to it, you have new words each time, or the one where you have new words, but then you come back to a section that repeats the melody and the words. And so that's musical form in a nutshell. Let's go home, right? Not, <laughs> not quite. Okay, I want to back away from that, but I just wanted you to, to get the idea that all along, every piece of music you've ever listened to and loved from Maybe songs you played at, uh, I mean, here nobody does this anymore. Sitting at the swimming pool with the transistor radio, listening to Motown when it was new. That's what I did with mm. the Supremes. I mean, their songs had form. Uh, every pop piece of music has form. Every Beethoven symphony has form. Every madrigal and motet from the Renaissance has form. Gregorian chant has form. Uh, every song you love from the musicals has form. It takes a while to learn them, although a lot of them are the same. And a lot of them are, are surprisingly simple. But backing away, as I keep promising, I want to go to something totally different. I want to go to mugs. Because I think what we can do with our kids with form is to get them thinking about form. This becomes not just musical form, but visual form and kinetic form. And that's really the arts. We never separate or try not to separate one art out, music only or painting only. So let's take mugs, right? What is a mug? First, you can define a mug. A mug is something that holds a beverage, right? Generally, we think of it as a hot beverage, right? So there's a mug. Actually, there you go. It has a form that has the pattern on both sides, yeah? That's a decoration within the form, right? Or a detail within the form. There's a mug, all right? There's a mug. How's this one? There's one. There's one. Okay, we're going to go through them all. Clink, clink. Here's another one. Some of you will recognize this. This is the Searcy mug that was available recently at some of the conferences. I don't know if you saw one or got And it says on it, the Searcy Institute, Wisdom and Virtue in Latin, of course. So there you go. 
right? See, I have a little Squeeze table. It. Isn't that lovely? This is a mug, which is kind of looks a little dated, and it is. It's for Blue Ridge Public Television. <laughs> tell you why that's a long time ago. I'm, I'm doing this slowly for a reason. This is a mug. It's fairly plain looking, right? And here are glass mugs for hot beverages. Could use cold, right? Or this happens to be a nice German one with very thin glass that somehow you manage to hold it and it doesn't burn you with hot beverages. Clever, mm. clever. I love those Scandinavian, German. They drink a lot of hot tea in those cold weathers. Now, if you want to think about historically form, the fact is, before mugs were popular, most people drank their tea from a cup, right? This happens to be my, I have, I'm very blessed with two sets of china. One was my mother's and one was the one that, that I acquired. And I like this very much because it's cheerful. Mm. And so far we haven't broken it all. It's really good. It's pretty durable. Now, this is what most people would have grown up with, something even more refined and delicate, right? And we could actually go back and trace history. We could go back thousands of years and figure out what form people used for a drinking mug and what it looked like and what it was made of and how it applied to that time and place. Most people, when they decide to have a cocoa or coffee or tea, these days aren't using cups and saucers, right? We've right. decided it's, first of all, it's not big enough. We want those, our culture is all about sizing up, isn't it? You can't get 40 eight ounces in this, right? And we want 32 ounces or 16 or 18 or 24. We are a big, big drinking the, society now. You the know big gulp. That we're the big, thank you, Paul. I was trying to think what that was, big gulp. Yes. So that in itself is cultural information of how a form like this no longer meets our needs, does it? Mm. Plus this is so much trouble and two pieces, and you have to have two hands and you can't drive with this very easily see so suddenly that form which has its place still if we're having you know thanksgiving dinner or having a birthday celebration this form's okay it's appropriate right yeah. but for running around and you know getting to work you probably don't use this paul is that a fair statement that would be a fair statement yes you can try Try it. That's the mug situation. For God. Yeah, I mean, you want something metal now, fits in the cup. See? Yeah. Okay. Think about that. Play with this idea. I'm not done yet with mugs. Play <laughs> with this idea with your kids because the form is a cup or a mug. I mean, a cup is a cup. What kind of cup? A mug. What does a mug mean? Well, it means blah, 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 blah. and how has it changed? They haven't thought about this. They're three and four and five and seven, and they don't think historically. They they notice. And they can put it together, but they are, of course, right. not equipped to think about what a mug would have been like in their great-grandmother's day. Which, by the way, this would have been my mother, which would have made, if, if I, I had your three-year-old as a, my grandson or five-year-old, this would have been a great-grandmother cup. This was my mother's back when mugs became sort of po popular. And she went nice. back to school after she finished raising us. And she, that was a big deal back then. And she got this over at the school one day, was very proud of this. And she had this, and this made her think about studying and going to school. There's a story then about this mug. Not too many people make this form like that. It's too small for one thing. Now, let me show you something else. See, and we're talking now about where mugs apply. This mug inside of it says the Fort Worth Zoo, where my daughter worked. And so of course it's penguins. It's not just cute. It was where she worked for a while. And so there's that, this meaning on this, not just the shape, but the meaning, the application. I'm going to spend a little more time on this idea. This is a mug given to me by a dear friend, Maria Rue. If she happens to watch this, she has a beautiful uh, custom of sending a mug to her friends, her girlfriends, her lady friends. And every time I think about her uh, or everything, I use this mug, which I use a lot. It's a great mug. I think of her, even though I've chipped it. Mm. See that little chip? You see? So again, a story, this is a form that has no meaning until I put a story with it or put it in a context. A form is just a mathematic, it's a shape, it's, it's, it's a physical object, but now it has a context, you know, each of these mugs. I'm not quite done. Um, the glass mugs, they're, they're, you know, we don't use a lot of these. They're too skinny, they're too thin, they break easy. We might in an elegant setting, whatever, we can talk about why don't we use more glass mugs in our culture. Although upscale, sometimes in a Starbucks, you see them, right? They have a message. This has one message. This has another message. And this little plain one I showed you, right? It's very plain, except when you look inside. <laughs> Kitty. So again, now, ooh, there's a surprise within the form, isn't it? <laughs> now, what if musically there are surprises like this within? Mm. 
what if, and now this is stretching a little bit, but what if I tell you that what Beethoven loved to do and other composers like him, he's not the only one, was take something like this, something that looked plain, like a first movement of a string quartet or a symphony or piano concert and stick a kitty in it. Basically nice. put something in that form that nobody's expecting. Right. And sometimes it made people laugh and sometimes it made people unhappy because it went against the rules. There was not supposed to be a kitty in the mug. That's a kitty. It doesn't look like it there. Can you see? There's yeah. not supposed to be anything in the mug. It's supposed to be a mug. Now we've got an animal in it. Right. right. Course, it's delightful for young ears, isn't it? And that's really the thing about music to keep in mind that as composers did new and different things, it was delightful for the younger ears and sometimes unhappy for the older ears. Hmm. Our ears are always behind the times. That's a fact. Are we done with mugs? I don't know, but why is that? What, are you gonna tell us why the older ears are like that compared to the younger ears? That's a different podcast. <laughs> okay. I would remind me, okay, if you wanna pursue that. I mean, I can't right. fully explain, but I can give you some of the right. Actually, I, that would, that's a, hey, write that down. Are you writing it down? <laughs> yeah. All right. Future podcast. Let's talk about that because our ears tend to be more than 100 years behind, generally speaking, in a lot of ways. Because you mm. can pay, play people music that was written in 1912 by certain European composers and they will call it modern sound. It's not modern. We don't do that with fashion. We don't do that with architecture. We don't do that with literature. We don't do that with visual art. People don't walk, walk by Jackson Pollock anymore and fall over in shock. They've seen it. They know yeah. what it is. They either like or don't like it. They know the context. But with music, these things, they Good don't point. catch up. Either. Yeah, that's our new podcast. Now, yeah. I'm going to get to music now, believe it or not. How it's easy for us. We have a vocabulary for this, don't we? We talk about what's made, glass, ceramics, painted, decorated. But we don't necessarily know how to put that to sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Here's the thing. It's repetition and contrast. Repetition and contrast, which is a simple thing. That's part of the solution anyway. Go back to our hymn. Right, sorry to make it racing through, but we have limited time. So <laughs> this is a part that we know the first, sometimes second verse, and then we're not sure what the words are after unless we've really learned it or have our hymnals. That is, it's using do re mi fa so. All right. Then what does it do in the in the refrain? This is my story. You see, we haven't been up to that pitch yet. We've been doing that. So when we go, this is my story. There's that note again. See, we have different chords. And it's all up higher. And then it goes low, da 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 And then it goes back. Now, we could go through that a lot, but you can sing that to yourself. And when you go, this is my story, when you find your verse going up, what's called a perfect fourth? It doesn't matter if you know that name. You feel it. And that's the hook that tells you this is that refrain. It's different. It's contrasting. It's contrasting because that is a different melodic pattern than the verse part. And it kind of goes, you know, we just did it. Okay. So again, that's fast. You don't really always want to go fast through musical things. You want to have chances to hear them over and over, but that's when people know. All right. Okay. For that, for the moment. Now, is that okay, Paul? That's okay. Yeah. We're but good. you hear that. You feel, and Furthermore, you feel it when you're singing. Yeah. That's when sometimes it's much easier to do um, things singing them because you hear them. Now, let me back off in a different direction. You take, I said that form is about repetition and contrast. And that form also has decoration within it. Um, sometimes it's not such a clear cut thing. Let me, if I can, let, me, let me give you an example that, that people know. You can take a simple form that repeats a verse form, all right? And I'm gonna give you a very sophisticated example. There was a farmer, what is it? That had a dog and bingo was his name, yeah? This yep. is sort of in two parts. That's the opening part of a single verse form because each time we're going to use this melody and then we go, B I N G O, right? We all right. know this one. Should we do it? No, we know it. Now, we decorate this or we vary it. 
the second half of this single thing because this, it's not like it goes off and goes, and I love my farmer dog. No, you don't have a middle section, do you? It's just the same thing each time. There was right. a man, you know, right? Each time it's one section. But what we do is vary it in the end because we do what, Paul? What do we do yeah. with b bingo? What do we do? We, we take away a letter and, and you know, replace it. Boy, it's been been a long time for me. But <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, okay. you know, I mean, we do it each time we do it. You know, we take away a letter and we replace it with just a sound. And, or know. silence. Right. A silence or a, uh, boom, you know. Yeah. Do you However do, we do yeah. that. Now, you can laugh. You know, people say, oh, that's a silly thing. No, it isn't. That is as sophisticated as anything uh, a grown-up does on a different level, of course, because grown-up composers have different devices. But think about that with a child. I-N-G-O, I-N-G-O. How about N-G-O, N-G-O, yeah. G-O, woo, G-O. Do you realize how much musical and mental and oral sophistication is embodied by doing that? Now, what we're doing is decorating a single form. And that's very common in, in, in many kinds of music. We have something established and we bury or decorate it. And that's why kids love it. What they're doing in their minds and what even as grownups we have to do, but we can do it easily. They have to work at it. They're actually adjusting a melody. They're changing. They're keeping the rhythm consistent. They're leaving out pitches and keeping the melody line going while kind of cutting part of it and pushing it off to the side or dropping it down. If you don't think that's sophisticated, it is. It's way harder than tying your shoes. Uh, I'm serious in terms yeah. of what's really going on in the ear and the mind. And of course, once they get it, they're delighted. And this is one of the great things about children's songs is that while, and that's why they want to do it over and over and over again, right? Because right. they're thrilled with the internal accomplishment that their ears, their minds, their voices, their hearts, their souls, their breath has achieved. Even though for us, it's like, oh no, they're going to do bingo again, right? But that's because we're no longer delighted by that. Mm -hmm. you know? And rediscovering the joy of children's songs, what's really going on there musically um, is, a, I think it's a good idea. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a worthy pursuit, all right? I'm going to leave Happy with Bingo. And I could go through more children's songs, but right now we'll just leave it with that one um, because it's, it's very different than, oh, I found this. I never leave anything. Those of you who know me, you know, I can't stop with something, but I will mention something like Itsy Bitsy Spider. Every time we sing that, we don't take the spider out and we don't respell, right? We just right. keep singing it over. So why do the kids love that one? There you go. And that's a question you can think about. We'll expect any, write me with the answer at carol at professorcarol.com. But that's, you know, again, with the children's songs, sometimes it's the form. Sometimes it's a decoration within the form. Sometimes it's another factor that's either musical, dramatic, meaning acting, literary, kinetic with movement, London Bridge, poof. You know, ring around the rosies, the best part is falling down at the same point every time. That's a kinetic, it's dance is what it is. So even in the simple level, the arts are filled with all of the, the sophisticated elements, but at a level and a brevity that a child can grasp, okay? And you're doing it whether you are giving it labels or not. All right, good? Whew. Nice. I'll take a breath. Okay, I'm taking a breath. Now, let me go to something else. And that is that we, we talked about a verse form where everything's the same, but we change the words or, or we don't. We've talked about a verse and refrain. We've talked about decorating within a form. Let's talk about one of the most popular forms of all Western musical uh, expression. And it's been around and it's still around. And it's something we call a ternary or three-part or ABA form. And this is repetition and contrast again. Um, you're going to find this in most popular music uh, with certain exceptions. But let's take, I was thinking about, and I'm going to have to play this really fast. And if this is your favorite Beatles song, I'm sorry. I don't mean to, you know, mistreat it. But let's take Yesterday, right? It's the first section, right? We could analyze that and break that up into the melodic fragments and the harmony. We're not going to do that today. Now, what happens again after that? What happens after that, Paul? Do the you repeat transition. that? Pardon? What's that? I'm, the transitions. Yeah, you do that part fast again. Right. If we do it the way John, he, the Beatles did, they sing it twice, mm -hmm. and then you, then you transition exactly to a new section, which is your middle section. <laughs> right.
suddenly, right? That is no different from what Mozart will be doing at the end of his middle sections when he brings you back to repeat of the first part. So it's A, B, A. Suddenly. Then we have that again, right? And then we repeat that to close it. So that's a three part form. Did that work for everybody? It goes A, A, because we do that first part twice. With new words. Then Y, D, right? Right, middle section. And we're back at A, B, A. Now, if you start thinking about it, we could we could spend mm, 750,000 hours now giving the names of all the songs that are written in ABA form or ternary form. It is, I mean, not just songs, major pieces of music that are basically large first section, possibly repeated, middle section, return to first section with some variations or decorations, usually within the harmonies. And then a little tail on the end, which we call a coda from Latin. But that's another talk. It's, codas are fun. That's when the composer gets to show off sometimes or to really be very, very clever. Or maybe just very, very touching emotionally. So three-part song. Go through songs you like. Um, I don't even know what to folk songs and, and popular songs and dance songs. And see if you can identify the middle. What you really need to do is identify the middle. Because once you identify that point when it goes off to the middle, you've got your A. Now you've got your B. And you have your return to A. Takes a little bit of listening for this. Now, your three-year-old might not found this as interesting as B-I-N-G-O. But for you, it's good to start listening for that contrasting section. All right? Okay? There's an assignment. And we can come back to more of those. Now, I have time for one more form, I think. Yeah, Paul? Yes. We have five minutes. So four minutes. Four minutes, which I'll probably stretch to six mm. or seven or eight, because you know how I tell time. That's a good thing about not being on a broadcast network, right? Because it'd be yeah. time for the commercials now, wouldn't it? That's right. Okay. I'm going to mention now another wonderful form that has fascinated composers in all styles of music. And there's many different ways to look at this and many different names, but it's the idea of variation. Now, if you go back to our mugs, you see these are very, very different. And let's say I could line them all up. Actually, my granddaughter, she, by the way, did not want to analyze the form she's initially. What she wanted to do was count them, right? She's four. She's counting everything. Mm. So it's funny. For a child, the first thing you kind of do when you have multiple similar objects, even disparate objects, but similar ones like buttons or shoes or, you know, plants at the, when you come back from the nursery and you've got a tray of begonias and the child wants to count them. And that's not unimportant, by the way artistically or intellectually or mathematically. It's huge right. mathematically. But it's also important artistically. How many have we got? So if I could line all these up, I could line them up historically. I could line them up geographically, right? But if I line them all up and I looked across the line, and I can't really do that, but you know what I mean, I would see maybe the theme is mug. What's the most kind of normal one here? I didn't bring a normal one. Boring one. This was normal until you found out I had a kitty inside, right? So, yeah, you know, that was boring. disturbing. It, that, that changed the whole thing, didn't it? And composers do that. I mentioned that. Yeah. We could line them all up, and I would have a theme mug, and then I'd have variations, right? And right. some of them would be big and loud and wild and heavy, and some of them might be light and musically airy. And then at the very end, I might want to throw them all together in a big pile, and I'd have kind of a great conclusion, wouldn't I? And I'd have a lot of glass on the floor. And sometimes yeah. that's what composers do, by the way. They throw it all together. Now, you... I haven't given an example yet of that, but I'm trying to point out that varying something is very common in our life. Think of how we tell stories. We make variations. Right. Think about the game of telephone, that even when you try to repeat something, you find yourself making variations. It's a human kind of decorative, even if it's conscious or unconscious, instinct. So a lot of music has been constructed where you take a theme and you vary it. Maybe one of the most famous ones, you all can find this all over on the on online, is Mozart's variations on this tune. Yes. Because when you make a theme and variation, you want a simple and usable, structurally clear song. Uh-oh. Could I have just picked something? It's A, B, A. Ooh. 
for section A. One. You know that? Middle section, B. Return to A. Well, we won't have the time to go through what Mozart does with this, but if you've never heard his variations on, uh, you'll find it with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Mozart that'll come up probably in 16 different instrumentations. Maybe ukulele, Paul, I don't know, it could be. Maybe. But what he does, what do you do with it? I mean, you can do anything. That's not necessarily what he did. We could go. You can also put it in the minor key. Right? You could do it slowly. You could turn it back, sort of upside down on itself. Because I've still got the same length of melody, the same kind of harmony under it. Again, endless, which is why composers keep doing it. They have done it, will do it, love to do it, and they like to do it by varying all the different elements. I have used my four minutes, but let me leave you with one example that's really fun for your kids. It's one of the great, I think it was written about 1928 by Maurice Ravel. Uh, many of you know that I'm a big fan of Ravel's music and in our uh, presentations at the conferences, I like to talk about with, with Janice Campbell, we worked together on a literature and music presentation and we used the Don Quixote songs by Maurice Ravel. When we're talking about the literature side, the novel, and we talk about the musical side and I like to use his songs on Don Quixote for that. But that being as it's May, Ravel, R-A-V-E-L, Maurice Ravel, um, died 1937, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, his most famous piece is this one called Bolero. I bet you know, Bolero, all right? And it goes like this. Right? Now on a piano, it's not very interesting. I mean, you can do that. That's your basic structure. This is what we call ostinato pattern. And then we have a melody, which wanders. And so in a respect, that's not a very good variation melody, not the way the Mozart is. However, what he does is he varies the timbre, the orchestral timbre. He varies and varies and varies by starting it out with, with the drums, with the... the by the end of Bolero, you have every instrument in the orchestra flying off. The energy level is so high. He does it by taking the timbre and increasing the texture and adding instruments and changing instruments and building momentum. And it's a specific type of variation that has a specific set of names, but it's done in a way that it was a ballet. It was written as a ballet initially, uh, one movement, one section, one long variation set. And think about how you could choreograph that, how you could change your, you could start with a very small dance movement and get bigger and more amazing and bring in other people and get more effusive. And of course, that's basically why, one reason it's so appealing because our ears dance to that. They mm -hmm. hear it, they respond, they dance. And I encourage you to, to find a recording of it. Um, live performance is great, absolutely. Blah, you'll be plastered. Uh, if you can see it dance, that's even more exciting. But even just listening to it and letting your children take this form, this variation, this repeating and varying, repeating and varying, and, and move to it or, or draw to it or, um, I don't know, get it any way you like to have them express, sing along with it, because they will be experiencing the power and the force of musical form. Okay. Mm. That's a start on musical form. What do you think, Paul? Oh, it's it's great. Let me tell you, repetition, contrast, this variation. I mean, you you, I love the illustration of the mugs. It's perfect. And and yes, they do like to categorize. Children love to categorize. I mean, there, there's a comedian who even had a term for it called he called it M and M and I's, where you give wow. a child a pack of M and M's, set them on the table. And I, even adults will do that, but they yes. will 
they will look for the differences in the, even though they're the same exact thing, they've got that little M, but they're the colors. So they take all the colors and they make little categories of them, of course. And then, like you said, they throw them all together and they eat them. Exactly. And that's a wonderful example. I would not have thought about that. And yes, adults do it just as much as kids. We just do it because we're fidgeting, right? Yeah. But, but kids are discovering and we're fidgeting. I'm not sure there's that great gap between those two things. Are you? Yeah, right. I agree. Beautiful example. I agree. Well, thank well, you. Yes, that is, that's great. I, I love it. We have a great lesson here on understanding form and uh, the, the mugs, the coffee mugs, and also just, you know, gives me a little insight as to why we, why we pick the coffee mug that we pick. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's <laughs> and why we pick the music that we pick. Well, that's true. And it all belongs somewhere in a context, which we call music history, yeah. you know, or our lives history. My mother, my friend, very different time periods. So, you know, it's never dull. That's the first thing we always need to remember when we're teaching. It's never dull. And for the children, it's brand new. Wow. And you have a way of absolutely being never, never dull when we're talking about music and music history. Things, as you, as you kind of mentioned, it sounds like it is, but you have a way of, of bringing it out and bringing it to life. And thank right. you thank so much for doing that. Thank you for helping me do it. Thank you. And we'll see you all on the next one in this series. All right. Take care. Take care.